All right, welcome back everyone. So our next set of presentations focuses on oncology. And it was scored by members, these abstracts were scored by members of the program committee as well as the oncology committee. Our moderators for this session are Dr. Jennifer Aldrink, who's a professor of clinical surgery and pediatrics and director of surgical oncology at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Sorry, it's just fun for me. Um, Nationwide Children's Hospital, Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Barry Rich is an assistant professor at Cohen Children's Medical Center, New Hyde Park, New York. Our chat manager is Diana Deason, who's associate professor in the Department of Surgery at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Good afternoon. We thank all the presenters for your important work, and I know more people will be coming in from the break. Uh, we'd like to invite our first speaker, Harold Larasse. Uh, where are all the children? A thematic analysis of state, territory, and tribal organization comprehensive cancer control plans. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. These are our disclosures. In 1998, the CDC created the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Plan. The goal of this program was to provide funding, guidance, and technical assistance to design and implement impactful strategic and sustainable plans to prevent and control cancer, which is a mouthful, but essentially means that the CDC wanted to create location-specific cancer control plans for the 50 states, eight territories, and seven tribal organizations. The goal of the National Can Comprehensive Cancer Control Plan was to improve primary prevention, enhance early detection and treatment of cancer, support survivors and caregivers, and implement health policy and health equity programs that demonstrate improvements in cancer outcomes. So why are these plans important? After the creation of cancer control plans, the CDC provides resources to help achieve the goals outlined by each group, namely a network of clinicians and professionals, logistic support, policy expertise, funding for these programs, and expert review of cancer control strategies. And the process through which these programs are implemented is actually quite interesting. So each group is tasked with creating a cancer control program with local stakeholders. They then attempt to execute these plans, constructing programs to help their populations and communities. And at five-year intervals, these programs are assessed for success and stability. And then plans are then revised and improved to address flaws and new needs. So with the knowledge of the importance of cancer control plans and the setting of uh, public health policy agendas and directing funding from the CDC, we sought to conduct a cross-sectional thematic analysis to assess the inclusion of pediatric oncology in this program. In this process, we assess the inclusion of children at large, the inclusion of a dedicated discussion of pediatric oncology, early detection and screening programs for pediatric malignancy, discussion of childhood cancer care and care innovation, discussion of access to care, discussion of reducing barriers to care for children who are currently undergoing cancer treatment, and inclusion of programs for childhood cancer survivorship. I'm going to show you a series of maps that represent each group's cancer control plans. The states that are in dark gray are those that meet the criteria for the variables that we were assessing during the study. First, we assessed which states had up-to-date cancer control plans. And uh, back to a few moments ago, that means that they had either submitted their cancer control plan or revised it within the last five years. As you can see here, 74% of states had up-to-date cancer control plans. Next, we assess the inclusion of children in cancer control plans, which we define simply as the use of the word child, children, youth, or pediatric. Thankfully, every state, territory, and tribal organization included children in their cancer control plan. We then sought to assess the degree of inclusion of pediatric cancer care in these plans. And this map re represents the states that had a dedicated section on pediatric oncology. As you can see here, only 30% of states included a specific section on pediatric cancer care. Inclusion of cancer screening and detection programs in children was limited to only seven states which included deliberate cancer screening programs and professional and public health education efforts to better identify pediatric malignancy. Deliberate discussion of pediatric cancer treatment and innovation in clinical care was included in 16 state cancer plans. This included the provision of care, treatment protocols, and research to improve cancer outcomes. Access to pediatric care was discussed in, or pediatric cancer care, excuse me, was discussed in 19 state cancer control plans. Access to care was defined as the discussion of care availability, geographic distribution of treatment centers, referral networks, and delays in care. 14 state cancer control plans discuss reductions of barriers to care. And while there can be many barriers to pediatric cancer care, we define this as affordability, logistic burden, financial support models, care pathways, and implementation of multidisciplinary care models that reduce clinic visits. Survivorship in pediatric cancer care was mentioned in 42% of cancer control plans. This included long-term care and support, surveillance for pediatric cancer patients, morbidity reduction, and, con and continuity of care models. 
So at large, children are included in all cancer control plans. However, meaningful inclusion of pediatric cancer care to better detect cancer, provide care, improve access, reduce barriers to care, and support survivors is lacking. And while children are included in all state cancer control plans, only a minority dedicate a specific section to pediatric cancer. It's often said that the states are laboratories for American democracy, and the inclusion of children, or perhaps their absence, is very meaningful. Expansion of these plans to include children will bring benefits to pediatric cancer care and may help to improve access uh, to care and long-term outcomes. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if any of this uh, has motivated you in any way, you can use this link to identify your local representatives and reach out to them. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. So to start the questions, that was yeah. my first one was what can we do um, because it looks like the majority of states are lacking yeah. significant in the policy. So what is the next step for? Yeah, I mean, so uh, my, my first step was to share this with a room of influential people who can uh, email their legislators. Um, I, I think after that, though, one thing I do want to share is we work with a really great community partner organization, the Children Cancer Partners of the Carolinas. They brought this to our attention. Uh, so working with other people to help to advocate for this on a, a state level, especially with these state cancer plans, I think is a big step that we can all do. Thank you. All right, thanks. Our next speaker will be Dr. Rachel Sunland, who will be discussing sonopermeation with SIM45, synergistically enhances LDOC's uptake and tumor apoptosis by decreasing zona occludens 1. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I have no disclosures. As we all know, neuroblastoma is the most prevalent extracranial solid tumor in infants and children, contributing to 15% of all childhood cancer deaths. High-risk neuroblastoma is treated with aggressive chemotherapy regimens, which are typically doxorubicin-based. Liposomal doxorubicin, or LDOX, extends the half-life and circulation from 30 minutes to roughly 30 hours, which allows targeting by sonopermeation. Sonopermeation is the use of focused ultrasound and microbubbles, which are gas-filled, sound-sensitive lipid spheres that disrupt cell bilayers and increase uptake of circulating drug. We have previously shown that sonopermeation with polydispersed microbubbles, or PMBs, increases LDOX uptake into neuroblastoma xenografts. Polydispersed microbubbles were originally developed as ultrasound contrast agents for ECHO. It has been found that the microbubble response to ultrasound pulse depends on its size. Large, size-isolated microbubbles, the SIMB45, have an enhanced, consistent, and predictable response when compared to polydispersed microbubbles, which range in size from 2 to 10 micrometers. This allows for improved targeted uptake of circulating drugs such as LDOX. We hypothesize that sonopermeation with SIMB45 would lead to increased tumor cell death, enhanced disruption in tight junction proteins, and enhanced disruption within the tumor vasculature when compared to polydispersed microbubbles. Tumor cells were implanted into the kidneys of nude mice and grown for five to six weeks. Mice were then divided into six groups, sonopermeation with polydispersed microbubbles, sonopermeation with the size isolated microbubbles, sonopermeation with either polydispersed or size isolated microbubbles and LDOX, LDOX alone, and untreated controls. After harvesting, tissues were examined using blue DAPI staining for the nuclei, green antizona occludens 1 for cells to cell tight junctions with red isolectin B4 to stain the endothelium, or red tunnel staining for apoptosis with green endomucin for vascular lumen size. In addition to tissue staining, we also measured tumor growth among the various experimental groups over a period of seven days after treatment. What we found was that sonopermeation with size isolated microbubbles alone, as demonstrated in the green line, decreased tumor cell growth. This decrease in tumor growth was amplified in the presence of LDOX, the red line. This decrease in tumor growth also correlates with the increase in tumor cell apoptosis or percentage of tunnel positivity, which was significantly increased using sonopermeation of the size isolated microbubbles alone and appears to work in synergy with LDOX. <clears throat> this increase in tumor cell apoptosis was not seen with polydispersed microbubbles. 
to understand a potential mechanism for decreased tumor growth and increased tumor apoptosis, as well as increased liposomal doxorubicin uptake within the tumors undergoing sonopermeation, we examined the tumor vasculature. We found that the widest axis of the vascular lumen was significantly dilated after sonopermeation with size-isolated microbubbles as compared to polydispersed microbubbles and controls. Tight junction staining for zona occludens 1 was clearly positive in the controls and tumors with polydispersed microbubble exposure. However, sonopermeation with uh, size-isolated microbubbles led to a clear reduction in zona occludens 1 within the tumor endothelium. Based on the findings in this study, we can conclude that sonopermeation with size-isolated microbubbles, the SIMB4-5, enhances LDOX delivery through increased vascular permeability and decreased zona occludens 1 tight junction proteins. Furthermore, sonopermeation with size-isolated microbubbles increases tumor cell apoptosis, both independently of and synergistically with liposomal doxorubicin. Our data suggests sonal permeation with size-isolated microbubbles can enhance medication delivery in targeted tumor cell death in neuroblastoma patients. Further studies will be done to determine whether the effect on zona occludens 1 is at the level of transcription or translation. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Kandel and Dr. Sonia Hernandez and the amazing group of people at the University of Chicago who made this entire study possible, as well as our partners at UT Dallas. Thank you so much. Question. Uh, Krista Grant from New York. Congratulations on a very uh, beautiful study. Um, I have two questions for you. One, how do you propose that we translate this clinically? Is this something that we're going to use intraoperatively or pre-op or for unresectable disease? And my second question is regarding your model. Have you considered the orthotopic model published by Newman where you inject your uh, tumor directly into the adrenal gland? Mm -hmm. So in regards to your first question, uh, I think it would be used in the preoperative setting. We are currently working on a larger rat model to simulate the tumor being in a deeper tissue. The nude mice, the tumor is right at the level of the skin and very easily visible. Um, and so we're working to further focus the ultrasound beams using some complicated algorithms and programming um, so that we can go deeper into the tissues and use it in a clinical setting. Um, in regards to your second question, um, we looked at multiple ways to grow these neuroblastoma xenografts and uh, we found that the best way for them to grow was actually implanting the tumor cells into the kidney itself. Thank you. Have, have you um, can you tell us a little bit about the technique, the sonopermeation within humans? So, uh, so sonopermeation within humans has been studied and is like well known, and so is sonoporation, which is slightly different, um, but has a similar principle. Um, I think the difference with what we're trying to do is to use the microbubbles to cause a disruption and increase drug uptake, with the ultimate goal of really reducing the amount of drug that you have to administer. Um, doxorubicin, as we all know, is, causes dose-based toxicity, and so the the real goal of this would be to reduce the amount of doxorubicin that we have to administer in order to reduce the uh, complications and effects of that. I have a question from the chat. Is there evidence of tissue damage from this technique of normal tissues surrounding the tumor? Yes. Excellent question. I'm so happy you asked that. Um, so, <laughs> um, so we examine the tissues um, we implant in the left kidney um, routinely. So the tissue on the top is from the spleen architecture, and as you can see, it's preserved. So it does not cause damage to the spleen, which is very locally um, adjacent to the kidney that is being sonopermeated. Um, and then we also examine the liver, um, and it does not cause damage there either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Mazar. The survival advantage of Zika viral therapy in human neuroblastoma in vivo models is dependent upon CD24. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, let's see. How does this work? Let me 
clean button. Oh, okay. All right. That works too. Um, okay. So, um, so uh, the topic of my study, and actually we've been working for a number of years now, uh, is based upon the use of Zika virus as a uh, um, oncolytic therapy for neuroblastoma. So a little background on neuroblastoma. Uh, it accounts for about 8 to 10 percent of malignancies in children, and it's the most common solid extracranial malignancy in children worldwide. Now, oh, there we go. Uh, it accounts for the, um, the most common malignancy in infants. It, uh, it accounts for about 40% present by the first year, and about uh, 11 to 13 pro out of a million children um, or under 15 years in the U.S. About one in 7,000 uh, births per year and 700 cases per year. Okay, but the most important characteristic is it accounts for about 15% of cancer-related deaths, which is significantly high if you consider it's only 8%, 8 to 10% of malignancies. Now, for neuroblastoma, there are a number of different uh, biological factors that are used to identify high risk versus non. Uh, age of diagnosis is important. MICN amplification, which is a DNA amplification, um, is considered typically high risk. All right, so Zika virus itself there we go, is a member of the Filiva Veridae family. So um, its viral genome is single-stranded RNA, so this is basically a large messenger RNA. So it gets into the cytoplasm uh, and translates pretty much immediately, within four to six hours of infection. So most cases of Zika virus are mild, uh, and, and in fact, many cases aren't even symptomatic. Um, our previous work indicated that Zika actually could be used to eliminate neuroblastomas based on the idea that these are uh, cells that are in a, de a developmental state, and this was actually shown originally in the cases in South America. So what we've actually determined also is that the cell uh, surface receptor CD24, which is a GPI-anchored protein, is actually responsible for regulating sensitivity versus uh, resistance. And so cells that express CD24 tend to be sensitive, and knockdown of CD24 actually induces resistance in cells. Okay, so we started our in vivo studies here using IMR32s, which is a MICN amplified high-risk uh, pretreatment uh, neuroblastoma. And so uh, we started by introducing the tumors, letting them grow, adding a virus, uh, and determining at what dose we could actually get necrosis. And so what we discovered is actually pretty much every dose was effective to a point, but about 2 times 10 to the 6 uh, virions, and this is single dose, we could get total elimination of tumor mass in about seven days. So we retained the mice for another four weeks. We had no recurrence. Um, and what we discovered, again, was that CD24 was well expressed both in vitro and in vivo, and even though there was variation, statistically it really didn't change. So they were sensitive in vitro, and they remained so in vivo. Now, what was surprising is we also screened a post-treatment cell line, SKNAS. So this is a very aggressive, high-risk tumor. Um, it grows very, very quickly. And what we discovered, actually, is that introduction of uh, Zika virus, which in vitro, these, uh, these cells actually were resistant to Zika viral killing. In vivo, actually, they were quite sensitive. And in fact, we had about 60 to 80% uh, loss of tumor mass in about 10 days with no recurrence. Uh, and that's over a four-week period following the initial study. So what was surprising, though, was that actually CD24 expression went up by about 20 to 30-fold in, uh, in the in vivo tumor compared to in vitro cells. So in other words, this is about 2,000 to 3,000 percent increase in expression. So it's quite dramatic. Um, what we found actually in vitro was that addition of CD24 exogenously actually did induce sensitivity. So you could simply add gene, uh, the gene expression and induce sensitivity, and it appears in vivo that did it on its own. So we asked the question, why would CD24 expression uh, uh, go up in vivo on its own? And we got an answer. So what we did was uh, we actually added CD24 exogenously to the tumor, uh, introduced it again, and watched to see what happened. And what we discovered, actually, was that CD24 exogenously expressing uh, tumors grew at virtually double the rate of normal tumors. So there's a massive proliferative advantage to the tumor to uh, express CD24. So this is in addition to the uh, expression it actually acquired by just being in vivo. And what we discovered, actually, surprising, well, I guess maybe not surprisingly, was that despite the proliferative advantage, the tumor had actually no particular additional protection against Zika viral killing. So a single dose of Zika virus could completely eliminate the tumor, even with the proliferative advantage. Now, we went ahead also and did a knockdown in IMR32. So these are a very well-expressing CD24 line, and they're extremely sensitive both in vivo and in vitro. And what we discovered was that we could easily knock down expression in vitro, and we really didn't see any side effects. 
when we tried to introduce this into a mouse, what we discovered is they were no longer tumorigenic. So we did multiple clones and multiple studies, and not a single tumor could form. So whereas there's a proliferative advantage to having additional CD24, there clearly is a necessity for tumorigenesis to retain it. Uh, so instead, we have to continue with in vitro study of the effect of knockdown of CD24, since we couldn't even form a tumor now. And what we discovered was loss of CD24 actually was protective to the cells uh, against secret viral killing. In fact, actually, it pretty much knocked it down by about 40 to 60 percent. So cells not only survived, but they also survived significantly longer. So this correlated with the previous work that we saw, and also the uh, correlative work with SKNAS. So gain of CD24 gave a proliferative advantage to the tumor, loss of CD24 lost tumor genesis. But on the other hand, CD24 expression induced sensitivity to Zika viral killing, which appeared to be rather permanent. Whereas loss of CD24 lost tumor genesis, but gained resistance to Zika viral killing. So finally, we did survival studies because in the end, that's really what matters. Is there a selective advantage to the host to actually use Zika virus as a therapy? And what we discovered with our pretreatment MIC and amplified lines uh, was that every single tumor that got Zika virus had loss of mass, and every tumor that was vehicle treated eventually opted the mouse out. So we had effectively 100% survival advantage. When we did this with our uh, SKNES post-treatment recurrent line, what we found is basically the same thing loss of, uh, of tumor mass was very rapid uh, and never recurred, whereas uh, vehicle treated, of course, opted out very quickly. So our conclusions are both our pretreatment and post-treatment recurrent lines were both sensitive to the virus, uh, irrespective of chemotherapy resistance that might occur in the cells. Um, Sensitivity to the virus appeared to be CD24 dependent, but clearly CD24 upregulation in vivo was dependent upon a, a proliferative advantage that it offered, which is why the tumors probably expressed it. But as a consequence, loss of that expression uh, inhibited engraftment and decreased the, vir uh, the rate of killing. So you have advantage, disadvantage. Likewise, the survival uh, advantage to the, uh, to the host was significant and virtually 100%, at least in these models. So future directions, uh, we plan to screen chemotherapy resistance, so added chemotherapy resistance in the in, the in vivo models, uh, in addition to uh, screening the actual mechanism of action for Zika resistance and sensitivity. In addition, uh, we'll be doing some uh, more advanced modeling, which includes both uh, humanized mouse immune systems and uh, PDX models. And I'll take questions. We have time for one question. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Jillian Jacobson, UT Southwestern. Excellent mm -hmm. study. Um, would you mind touching on how you administer this therapy? And as you know, a number of children present with metastatic disease. If it is by injecting it locally into the tumor, do you see this therapy having an effect on metastatic models or just the localized disease? So these are direct injects, yep. And so that's where we've started the study. Um, the advantage of the virus is that there are basically no side effects to the mouse whatsoever. They're all asymptomatic. And it actually has nothing to do with the fact that it's a mouse versus a human. There was a study done in 2017 that showed that knockout of type 1 interferon in the mice made them completely sensitive to the virus, and they eliminated them. Uh, but as to your question, um, the intention is for now is to be direct inject into the tumor or tumor bed, which could obviously suppress recurrence. But as for metastatic, uh, the problem is, is that Zika being a flavivirus is promiscuous and effectively can infect any cell it comes in contact with. But likely due to interferon, this is why humans are 80% asymptomatic. So the issue with doing a metastatic was that you'd have to induce a significantly larger dose, and you probably would want to pr uh, put it reasonably close to where the masses are. So. Our next speaker will be Dr. Bailey Roberts, who will be discussing the loss of IRF5 is associated with increased metastases and worse prognosis in osteosarcoma. Um, thank you. My name is Bailey Roberts. I'm a general surgery resident at Northwell. Excited to talk to you today. I have no disclosures. Osteosarcoma is a malignant pediatric tumor of the bone. Gross metastasis at the time of diagnosis is present 20% of the time, and the most common site of metastasis is the lung. Overall survival worsens from 80% to 20% for metastatic disease. Recurrence is very common in osteosarcoma, and it's also most likely to recur in the lungs. 
Interferon Regulatory Factor 5, or IRF5, is a transcription factor that regulates interferons and activates the immune system. It's primarily expressed in lymphocytic cells, and it's known especially for its role in autoimmune disease. In oncology, it's found to be a tumor suppressor in many other cancer types. The presence of IRF5 is associated with better prognosis in breast, colorectal, pancreatic, and gastric cancers. It has been shown to regulate cell migration and proliferation in breast and pancreatic cancer cells. IRF5 expression in the tumor or tumor microenvironment contributes to reduced metastasis. Thus, understanding its role in osteosarcoma is important for prognosis and potential immunotherapeutic options. The aim of our study was to determine if IRF5 and osteosarcoma correlates with metastasis, recurrence, and overall survival. We used two similar cell lines with varying metastatic potential. K12 is a spontaneous osteosarcoma with low metastatic capability, whereas K7M2 is a highly metastatic osteosarcoma. It was created from taking an osteosarcoma in a mouse that metastasized to the lungs and reimplanting the pulmonary metastasis in the lungs for two cycles, thus giving it the name K7M2. As you can see in this Kaplan survival analysis, uh, K7M2 has significantly worse overall survival compared to K12. In our preclinical model of osteosarcoma, we perform an intratibial tumor injections of either the K7M2 or K12 cells. We allow the tumors to grow for five weeks and then collect the lungs to examine the metastatic burden. Additionally, using Western blot, we compared the IRF5 protein levels in the cell lines. We found, not unexpectedly, that K7M2 has a significantly higher uh, amount of metastasis compared to K12. Additionally, K7M2 has virtually no IRF5, whereas K12 has high levels of IRF5. This correlation shows that the cell line with higher levels of IRF5 has less metastasis and higher overall survival than the cell line with the lower IRF5 levels. To corroborate this in human samples, we use the National Cancer Institute target database. This database includes adolescent and pediatric tumors from the COG in various hospitals around the world. RNA sequencing was performed on these tumors and we correlated survival, metastasis, recurrence, with IRF5 mRNA expression. Additionally, we used a human osteosarcoma tumor tissue array and performed immunofluorescence staining for the IRF5 presence in the tumor. We found that overall survival was significantly better in patients with the highest quartile of IRF5 expression, shown on the red curve, compared to patients with the lowest quartile of IRF5 expression, which is shown in the blue curve. Further, higher levels of IRF5 correlated with lower levels of metastasis or recurrence, indicating a protective effect of IRF5. Next, we stained human tumor samples with IRF5, indicated by the green fluorescence, and quantified the amount of tumors with positive staining over the background. We found significantly more samples of normal bone had a positive IRF5 signal, which progressively decreased with increasing T stage and increasing grade. This represents a loss of IRF5 with increasing severity of disease. Further, we can also see a trend towards decrease amount of IRF5 staining with increasing tumor T stage and grade, as seen by the decreasing amount of green fluorescence in these images. In conclusion, IRF5 acts as a tumor suppressor in osteosarcoma. The loss of IRF5 is associated with worsened overall survival, higher tumor grade, and higher metastatic rate in a mouse model and in human osteosarcoma tumor samples. The loss of IRF5 in tumor tissue may be used as a novel biomarker for determining metastatic risk or prognosis in osteosarcoma. I'd like to thank my lab and the Department of Pediatric Surgery at Cohen's and my mentor, Dr. Sofer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, a uh, great study. Uh, my question for you is, um, have you considered thinking about using IRF5 more at, um, in a therapeutic standpoint, and if so, in what ways? Um, actually, yes. Uh, so I believe that IRF5 um, is acting on the um, surrounding microenvironment, um, and there has been a few studies that have actually um, put IRF5 into small nanoparticles targeting towards the macrophages in the immune environment, um, and they're able to reduce metastasis in ovarian cancer, glioma, and um, uh, metastatic melanoma models. 
And so we're looking into exploring something like that as well. Are there any agents that will upregulate IR5? Yes, there are some. Um, IR5 is very differentially expressed um, and mostly expressed in lymphocytic cells. Um, so there are a couple of agents that um, would upregulate it, um, but we would need to target the tumor microenvironment as to not activate the immune system and cause some sort of autoimmune mm -hmm. disorder. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Andy Espinoza um, to be discussing preclinical testing pipeline reveals novel treatment strategies for chemotherapy resistant hepatoblastoma. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you guys today. I have no disclosures. Hepatoblastoma is the most common liver malignancy in children. And while patients with low risk disease have high rates of survival, patients with chemo resistant disease have high rates of relapse and death, resulting in survival rates of less than 50%. One of the proposed mechanisms of chemo resistance is through the expression of histone deacetylase, or HDAC, which allows tumor cells to develop escape mechanisms, resulting in chemo resistance. Thus, HDAC inhibition has been proposed as a treatment strategy for chemo resistant tumors. Given that our group has previously found that hepatoblastoma tumors have elevated pan-HDAC expression, we sought to study targeting pan-HDAC inhibition in hepatoblastoma. We started by taking patient tumors and creating 3D spheroids to drug screen a pan-HDAC class inhibitor, panabinostat, with our hypothesis that this would be effective in hepatoblastoma in vitro. When we treated with the monotherapy of panabinostat and compared it to standard chemotherapy, we noted an average cell viability of around 30 to 50% in the two different patient-derived spheroids, as shown here in the green circles. But when we used the combination of vincristine, arinotecan, and panabinostat as a combination therapy, we saw the lowest cell viability in these two different patient-derived spheroids, as shown in the red circles. To further test this drug combination, we created two different chemoresistant patient-derived xenograft models, or PDXs, with our hypothesis that this combination therapy of vincristine arinotecan and panabinostat, or VIP, would be effective in treating these two treatment refractory PDX models. We created the PDXs using a previously described technique for orthotopic implantation that our group has previously published. And these tumors were tracked with weekly MRIs. AFP levels were ran and drawn from the mice uh, facial vein to confirm the evolution of a hepatoblastoma PDX. And drug studies were started when AFP levels were greater than 100 nanograms per milliliter. We saw an increase in tumor size on weekly MRIs. And tumor burden reflected what we would see in patients, at, but in mice, of about 0.1 to 0.4 centimeters cubed in volume. And these mice were euthanized after six weeks of treatment or after tumor burden reached about one centimeter cubed in volume. When we evaluated the placebos, shown in blue, they reached about a volume of about one centimeter cubed in a, in a week in both PDX models. In contrast, the combination of vincristine and arinotecan had an, a decrease in tumor size during the first week that continued to increase weekly until six weeks when the study was completed. But when we compared the treatment groups to the VIP treatment of Vincristian, Ernatecan, and Panabinostat, shown in red, we noticed the decrease in tumor size that was maintained throughout the six weeks. Here, we've eliminated the placebos to further emphasize the difference in size between the VI and VIP treatment schemes. And to depict these changes, we have here the start of the study MRI with the VIP, treated, the VIP tumors on the left and VI to the right of that. And as you can see at the end of the study, we could appreciate a significant decrease of size in the VIP treated tumors compared to the significant increase in the VI treated mice. We also drew uh, AFP levels at the three and six week marks or at the end of when mice were euthanized. And we were able to show that the AFP levels in the VIP treated mice 
had a decrease of both three and six weeks that was statistically significant compared to the VI and placebo groups. And when we evaluated the histology of the first PDX model, we found that the placebos had an average cell viability of around 95%. Similarly, the VI group was noted to have 95% viability. But in, to contrast, the VIP treated tumors had an average percent viability of around 25% that was statistically lower than both groups. In addition, we also noted significant treatment effects as shown here in the red circle, showing mesenchymal changes, changes in calcification. And then when we looked at the second PDX, we noticed similar results with statistically lower cell viability and similar mesenchymal changes. So to conclude, our study showed that the combination of vincristine, arinotecan, and panabinistat, or VIP, resulted in cytolytic effect in preclinical models. To our knowledge, this is the first study to show effective cytolytic effect in hepatoblastoma PDX models. At the microscopic level, we were able to appreciate high levels of necrosis and mesenchymal changes. And given these results, we believe that after validating in more chemoresistant PDX models, this therapy has the potential to be included in clinical trials for high-risk hepatoblastoma. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Vasudev, and my lab, our collaborators, and our funding sources for their support. And I'm happy to take any questions. That's great work. Um, did you keep the mice alive long enough to notice any toxicities or tumor shrinkage in your MRIs? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your question. So um, the mice that were treated with the dose that we chose for the VI and VIP after doing a number of toxicity studies, mm -hmm. the dose that we chose, at they, they, we didn't notice any significant toxicity damage. There was no hair loss, no pain. They, mm -hmm. And when we tracked the tumor, the weights of the actual mice, they were all fairly stable, if not increasing, with all three treatments. Okay. Great work. Uh, Tim Loss from Chicago. Um, has this regimen been used in any phase one or phase two trials for other tumors where you would know the tolerability, tolerability of it? Sometimes combining the cytotoxic chemo with these newer agents can kind of have some amplified toxicity profiles. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your question. So the combination of vincristine and TK and panabinistat hasn't been previously treated with other uh, tumors. There are some phase one and phase two trials using panabinistat as a monotherapy. And that was actually one of the ways that we chose the, the dosing for our mice. We wanted something that would be equivalent or less what the human equivalent was, and it was lower than what we would give to a human. And at least in the phase one trials, panabinistan as a monotherapy hasn't really caused any significant side effects. So we would anticipate, hopefully, given the combination of what we see with our mice, that we wouldn't see those. But again, those would need to be the next steps to validate. Okay. Uh, quick question, Chris DeGrant from New York. Um, you show that after week five or six, the tumor started to grow again on your VI therapy. Is that because of resistance? And if so, what's the mechanism of the synergism with the VIP? Yeah, that, those are great questions. And those are actually very interesting things to point out because we're not, we're not fully sure that's, that's the answer for both, both questions. The VI treated uh, tumors that eventually rose there's likely some sort of escape mechanism that the hepatoblastoma cells are adapting and creating through that. Um, and then with the, the, the VIP-treated tumors, it's, it's hard to say whether exactly what the mechanism is. There are some studies on using in arinotecan and panabinistat in some in vitro, in vitro studies that there might be some acetyl-P53 activation that's occurring, but those, all those studies about the exact mechanism are still ongoing at this point. Thank you. Nice work. Thanks. Uh, quick question. Has, has the drug been used in any capacity for any other pediatric solid tumors? So, so the, a lot of the studies that's been using for panabinistat has been mainly just um, blood type cancers, so ALL, uh, some lymphomas, um, but there are some ongoing studies in terms of using it for solid tumors. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. The next presenter will be Dr. Brittany Levy, um, presenting how many lymph nodes are enough for staging in paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma. Hello, I'm Brittany Levy from the University of Kentucky, and thank you for the opportunity pr to present our work titled, How Many Lymph Nodes Are Enough for Staging in Paratesticular Rhabdomyosarcoma? 
As many of you are familiar with, there are multiple subtypes of paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma, and in addition to these, we frequently consider the genetic status of Pax fusion to better stratify risk. Treatment of paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma is largely surgical, with further therapy determined by the stage of disease. Staging is related to the TNM system, and therefore requires an understanding of lymph node positivity. Lymph node basins for paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma include the lymph node basin in the retroperitoneum, inferior to the renal vein, medial to the ureter, and inferior to the common iliac artery bifurcation. Patients with paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma who have lymphadenopathy or who are older than 10 years of age are recommended to have lymph node sampling for appropriate staging, mostly in order to provide accurate recommendations for post-resection adjuvant therapy. However, the number of lymph nodes needed for adequate staging has long been sought after. Recently, the Children's Oncology Group recommended 7 to 12 lymph nodes, which was determined based on a diminishing return statistical model. A prior SEER review identified that over 80% of patients have less than 10 lymph nodes excised. We desired to use a beta binomial model to validate these recommendations. The beta binomial model works by using probabilities and is able to take into account the likelihood of a nearby lymph node being positive or negative if a prior positive lymph node was identified. This model has been validated in many other cancer types. Therefore, this study aimed to validate the current literature recommendations of 7 to 12 lymph nodes for lymph node sampling in patients with paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma using an alternative database and statistical model. And these were our methods. We used the NCDB to query patients with paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma from 2004 to 2018 who had an indication for lymph node sampling. We then looked at their lymph node density, which we calculated as lymph nodes positive over total lymph node yield, and ascertained the number needed to sample to reduce the chance of missing a positive lymph node to less than 10% based on this beta binomial model. And these were our, our results. Overall, this patient selection method yielded about 67 patients, and the beta binomial model identified the likelihood curve of missing nodal disease based on the number of lymph nodes examined. Here we see that 13 lymph nodes are needed to reach that less than 10% threshold. Based on this model, we were able to identify the probability of missing lymph nodes with each number of increasing lymph node yield. And we can see that with the current recommendations of 7 to 12 lymph nodes, there's a 10 to 20% chance of missing a positive lymph node and understaging, which has treatment recommendation implications. For this project, we aim to further validate these findings in a second database to ensure the results are reproducible using the statistical model. And in conclusion, we should consider refining the current guidelines to sample at least 13 lymph nodes. Thank you for your attention. I'm glad to take any questions. Question. Uh, great presentation. Tim Lotz from Chicago again. My concern is that once you start talking about 13 lymph nodes, it's hard to call that sampling. So, um, you know, we talk about sampling and William Sumer saying five lymph nodes. Really the question is, is are you doing a template dissection or are you doing sampling? And if you're saying you need 13 lymph nodes, you're basically saying you need a template dissection. And maybe that is the case, um, but I, I think we need to, as a field, try to define that. And, and it seems to me like the future is going to go towards a sentinel node model where you're getting the right lymph nodes instead of just a number of lymph nodes. Um, but we admittedly don't have that data yet. Um, but if you're going for 13 nodes, you're probably doing a template. Was there data in the NCDB regarding a, a complete RPLND versus sampling? Not in the data that we yeah. analyzed, and because it's such a small, really, number of patients that we found that required this lymph node sampling, there was quite a bit of missing data related mm -hmm. to kind of the intricacies. Arjuna yeah. Yeskata from Cincinnati. Um, so when we created the 7 to 12 lymph node um, guideline, we looked at um, about 400 operative notes on patients through the COG and internationally to come up with this recommendation. And many of the lymph node dissection operative notes were mesenteric nodes, they were portal nodes, they were all over the place, right? So the, the NCDB doesn't give you the granular data that you need to know actually what lymph nodes were actually even taken. So the reason the 7 to 12 lymph node recommendation was made is because people weren't doing the, a template dissection. They weren't doing the proper lymph nodes. So it was sort of the better of two evils in terms of trying to get something that everybody could get their head around doing rather than saying you're going to need to do 13 nodes because that would, nobody, was, nobody was doing that. Yeah, that's a great comment. 
I have a question about the methodology in the beta binomial model and the l less than 10%. Can mm -hmm. you give us a little bit of background of how, you, how that 10% was selected? Yeah, we looked at um, when they use this model for Wilms and also for thyroid, 10% seemed to be the place that they looked at. Um, when they looked at colon cancer, they really looked at 12 to 15% as that cutoff, and so we chose 10% uh, since Wilms was also in a pediatric uh, population. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next presentation is by Dr. Stephanie Langloy. APOBEC2, its role in the Panexin 1 mediated inhibition of rhabdomyosarcoma progression and potential as a novel therapeutic target. Thank you. Rhabdomyosarcoma, or RMS, is a cancer thought to arise from a myogenic defect and for which better therapies are needed. Our lab has previously shown that Panexin 1 is expressed in skeletal muscle. Panexin 1 form channel, best known for their role in ATP release. We've shown that Panexin 1 level increased during muscle development in vivo, and since this is a short talk, I've included here the publication link to this if you would like more information. I've identified Panexin 1 channels and a novel regulator of myogenesis, both in vitro and in vivo, as we have shown that when uh, we overexpress Panexin 1, we promote myogenesis, while when we inhibit its function, its channel activity, or if we knock it down, we inhibit myoblast fusion. Based on this and the fact that inducing RMS differentiation is thought to have therapeutic potential, we've started to look at Panexin 1 in rhabdomyosarcoma. We found that Panexin 1 levels are low in RMS, and when we increase its expression, we found that it inhibits in pro its progression both in vitro and in vivo. Interestingly, we found that Panexin 1 does not form functional channels in rhabdomyosarcoma. And using either Panexin 1 channel blockers or Panexin 1 mutants that are devoid of its channel activity, we found that Panexin 1 inhibits rhabdomyosarcoma progression through a mechanism that's independent of its channel function. Since this was the first time that a channel independent function was found for Panexin 1, we used a combination of unbiased approach to get insight as to how this may occur. And uh, one of the approach was using RNA-seq. We found several genes that either go up and down when Panexin 1 is overexpressed. One um, hit that we found interesting is APOBEC2, which is downregulated when Panexin 1 is overexpressed. Even though there's not much that's known about it, um, what we thought was interesting is that it's been shown to repress the expression of non-myogenic pathways. And also, uh, skeletal muscles from APOBEC2 knockout mice display increased expression of differentiation markers, as well as enhanced myoblast fusion, which can be assessed by um, multinucleation. So this was done in the patient-derived cell lines RH30, and we wanted to see if that downregulation is also seen at the protein level. So you can see here on the left, the Western blot quantification on the right. So we saw that Panexin 1 uh, overexpression reduced APOBEC2 levels at the protein level. Uh, we wanted to see, we have five other cell lines in the lab, so we performed the same experiment, and we found that this downregulation was seen in three out of those um, six cell lines. So based on the role of Panexin 1 and APOBEC2 in cell fusion, we went back to look at our um, previous data on multinucleation in the RH30 cell lines, in which we've seen that when we increase Panexin 1, we're seeing more cells that are multinucleated or more cell fusion. Interestingly, we didn't see that in the RH18 cell lines. So again, we went and looked at our four other cell lines, performed the same experiments, and we found that Panexin 1 increased multinucleation in three of those patient-derived cell lines. And interestingly, those are the same three in which we saw that Panexin 1 um, overexpression triggers the downregulation of APOBEC2. So based on this um, association between uh, the cell fusion or multinucleation and uh, the effect on APOBEC2, we wanted to see what could be the role of this downregulation in this process. So we engineered the RH30 cell lines to overexpress Panexin 1 with or without APOBEC2 overexpression and look at the multinucleation. As expected, we saw that the upregulation of Panexin 1 triggers multinucleation in these cells, but this was abolished when APOBEC2 was overexpressed, and it's getting that the downregulation of APOBEC2 plays a role in this process. Um, 
there's not nothing known so far in the whole of apobectu and rhabdomyosarcoma, so we wanted to get a better sense of what it could do. So we engineered our uh, RH30 cell lines to express GFP or the green uh, fluorescent protein so we can grow these as um, tumors in vitro and using our IncuSight live imaging system to monitor their uh, formation and growth. So you can see here after 10 days and the quantification on the right. So the blue line is the cells that overexpress ApoBec2 and you can see when they have more ApoBec2 they actually grow uh, faster at least uh, in vitro. So in conclusion, we've previously shown that penexin 1 levels are low in RMS compared to skeletal muscles. We've shown that increasing PENX1 levels inhibits the RMS progression both in vitro and in vivo. And here, even though we have a lot more to do, more work to do on this, we've shown that PENX1 triggers RMS cell multinucleation by downregulating APOBEC2. This brings insights into how PENX1 can inhibit rhabdomyosarcoma malignant properties. As I've said before, that this, uh, we found that this was true a channel independent function. This is also the first study to identify a role for ApoBec2 and RMS, as we've shown that higher ApoBec2 level promotes RMS tumor growth, at least in vitro, and that the downregulation of ApoBec2 either by increasing Penexin 1 or another strategy may have therapeutic potential for rhabdomyosarcoma. And here I would like to acknowledge uh, the two trainees that have done the bulk of the work on Penexin 1 and RMS. Thank you. Yeah, Bo Lover, Nashville. I want to congratulate you, Dr. Langlois, and your team uh, for this amazing study. Can you comment, maybe I missed it in the methods, but can you comment on translocation status and how that impacts manipulation of APOBEC2 or PENEXIN1? Thank you, and congratulations. This is terrific work. Uh, translocation in terms of Subcellular localization? Or? No, sorry, the PAX FOXO1 translocation? Yeah, to... we've looked a bit into that because we were like wondering, like we always like to use many patient derived cell lines because they all have, diff even though they all, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, they all have like different characteristics. And we're surprised to see that the effect is seen in three out of six. And we've looked at trying to identify if this could be a potential uh, pathway linked to this, whether it was linked to male versus female, because we actually found a role of panic and normal muscles that it has a more significant in the male as opposed to female. It's not linked to that. It's not linked to, um, you know, pretreatment or not, embryolar, alveolar fusion status. So right now we're trying to take advantage of the fact that we see the effect in three cell lines and not in the other, trying to figure out how this, um, how Penexin 1 can actually downregulate the POBEC 2 and maybe try to rescue this in these cell lines where we cannot uh, see the effect, see if it could be more potent potentially. Has APOBEC 2 been implicated in any other tumors uh, in vitro or in vivo? There's really not much uh, about it so far. So that's what we found uh, quite interesting with our unbiased approach is that a lot of the genes that came up are not something that we would have thought about by looking at the literature. They all, uh, because so far what's known with Panex1 is the, m most of the time is the ATP release, the P2 receptors is the common pathways. So we found that also we published that Panex1 interact with HNAC and that's how it mediates cell death. But again, it's another, uh, mm -hmm. they're pretty novel and we have to, more work to do on this. And how do you see translating this into studies that we can use to treat rhabdomyosarcoma? Yeah, so uh, what we've done for Panexin 1, because we wanted for that trying to find a, a drug or a molecule that we can um, can use to increase its expression. So we, there's um, a lab at our institute from Dr. Alex McKenzie that has performed I uh, used FDA drugs and treated the uh, a neuron cell culture and look at all the genes that go up and down and publish this as a searchable actually database and you can search for your gene and interest and seeing which one, uh, which drug increase your gene or decrease. So actually we found doing this that quercetin, uh, which is a plant flavonoid, increase 
at least based on this database and around increased panx one so we actually used it in panx one uh, in rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, sorry, and at least in vitro, um, it inhibits um, tumor formation and growth and triggers the uh, regression of the spherids. So the next step is trying this in vivo and trying in, com in combination with chemotherapeutics and see if that helps. Great, thank you. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Martha Takei, who will be discussing leveraging a novel ex vivo human tumor system to interrogate peritoneal surface malignancies in children. All right, thank you for that introduction. Again, I'm Martha Teke. I'm from the Hernandez Lab at the National Cancer Institute. And I have the sincere pleasure I'm presenting leveraging a novel ex vivo human tumor system to interrogate peritoneal surface malignancies in children. I have nothing to disclose. So peritoneal surface malignancies in children are very rare. They account for approximately 50 to 250 cases per year, and a few small round cell tumor, which is the most common, accounts for about 10 to 15 new cases per year. However, it overall forms a heterogeneous group of tumors with the sarcomas and then epithelial tumor types, including like ovarian and gastric cancer. But due to the rare histologies and incidents, there's a true need for a window of opportunity tumor model in pediatric PSM. I mean, we would want to evade potential morbidity and mortality to pediatric patients in the experimental setting and overall maintain or improve their quality of life. But what tumor models do we have currently available? Well, we have cell culture, patient-derived organoids, organ on a chip and mice models, but we've all seen multiple times that these, all these models have challenges in their translatability into actual patient outcomes. But what would an ideal tumor model look like? We'll have the tumor and also have the intact stromal structure as well as the vasculature and an intact uh, tumor microenvironment and immune microenvironment. And this would be able to be maintained in physiologic conditions for a period of time and amenable to drug testing and therapeutic testing and overall be translatable into patient care. So at the NCI, we developed the SMART system and this stands for Sustained Microenvironment for Analysis of Resected Tissue and I'll take you through our workflow here. So we start off with a clinically indicated diagnostic laparoscopy where we procure tumor-bearing peritoneum and this tumor-bearing peritoneum is placed on a 3D printed platform as you see on the right side of the screen and we generally try to get at least one to two tumors or nodules on each platform. This platform is placed in our smart system which contains a chamber and this chamber holds up to four of these 3D printed platforms that have tumor-bearing peritoneum on it. And before the case we take the patient's blood and spin it down to make uh, plasma-based perfusate, and this perfusate tends to be the media that we circulate within the system. It's circulated with a peristaltic pump, and it's also connected to an oxygenator that provides both CO2 and O2 to the tissue. Lastly, there's a syringe pump that allows us to adjust the electrolytes and keep the system within human physiologic conditions. And we've seen over multiple tumor types that in four days, we are able to maintain tissue vi uh, viability in H&E and standard immunohistochemistry on various immune markers. And then once the tissue is maintained in our system, we have four main pillars of interrogation, as you can see on the right side of the screen. But we did have a pediatric patient that came through, and this is a 17-year-old female that had metastatic gastric cancer to her peritoneum. And you can see both axial and coronal imaging that she had advanced disease. So it was treated on, with Kpox and Flot, but still had persistent malignant ascites that needed a pleurix catheter for drainage, and ended up, and ended up needing a G-tube for nutritional support. And she was enrolled in our HIPEC protocol. So just a brief background on gastric cancer in children. Overall, both adults and children, there's a 14% initial presentation of peritoneal carcinomatosis with gastric cancer. This is still very rare in children, and it pretends for a very poor survival at 5.3% five-year overall survival and a three to four-month median survival. 
So there is a need for new emerging therapies, including HER2 therapies and immunotherapies. So when we got her tissue and placed it into the system, we used one of our newer immunotherapies at the NCI called N803. And this is an IL-15 super agonist that works by increasing immune cell proliferation as well as specifically T and NK cell uh, proliferation for tumor-specific cytotoxicity. And as you can see here on the graphs, in just 24 hours, we do see an appropriate response with CD3 increase, which indicate for T cells. So at over 24 hours, the control in the black and the drug treated in the gray, you see there's an increase in the peritumoral T cells, as well as an increase in the peritumoral immune cells in terms of proliferation as evidenced by KI67. So the extrapolation of this data should be limited given this is a sample size of one, and also this drug tends to be used in combination with other therapy. However, it does show that our model is able to maintain tissue and it is appropriately responsive to drug therapy. So in conclusion, I hope I've been able to convince you that we have developed a novel ex vivo human perfusion system that not just recapitulates the human TME, but is amenable to drug testing. And although we use it for adults at the NCI, it is also translatable to children and use in the pediatric population. And with that, I would like to thank my PI, Dr. Jonathan Hernandez, and our group for um, all the hard work that has been put into this. I'll open it up for questions. That's great work. How do you account for the influx of immune cells into your system? Well, thank you for that question. So since it's a closed system and we use a lot of immunotherapy, it is important to have influx of immune cells. And that is actually what I specifically have been looking into in, the, in my uh, time at the NCI. So if you can see here, when we extrapolate it further on, there's actually a loss of all immune cell populations. But we have developed a system that actually allows for injection of these immune cells. And I'm trying to advance it, and it's not really advancing. But if, if I could, there it goes, you'd see that you can actually in, inject the patient's own immune cells into the system. And we have seen these immune cells migrate to the tumor microenvironment and somewhat simulate a recruitment of immune cells to the tumor microenvironment. Now, it's in its early stages, but it is important that if we're going to introduce immunotherapy, we have a, an avenue of, of uh, re uh, recapitulating immune uh, recruitment. So we are working on this. Again, it's in its early stages, and I'm excited to see how far it will take this specific model forward. But yes, we are looking into that. Thank you. Question. Hi, it's Omid from Germany. Thank you very much for this fantastic work. I just have one question regarding the emerging, uh, emerging therapies and treatment options, because you mentioned the HIPEC therapy. I know that a lot of centers are now moving to PIPEC therapy, having aerosol therapies, and they showed in rodent models that the uptake of the chemotherapy, having the aerosols, is a lot better in combination with the HIPEC. And you would have the benefit that you would have relaparoscopies during these treatment episodes where you could take those biopsies and have this special treatment. Uh, is this something that you have in your institution as well and you're planning to implement in this system? Thank you so much for that question. Yes, so we have looked into PIPEC. We don't do PIPEC at the NCI, however, um, due to some various regulations, but however, we have been doing um, uh, intraperitoneal pump therapy. So we leave like intraperitoneal catheters and uh, give chemotherapy over time and have been taking tissue from that as well, which is similar to uh, 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 inter intermittent PIPEC. And so the data from that is still ongoing, but yes, that would be helpful to be able to expose the tissue over time and then actually see the differences in the tissue over time from the patient, as opposed to with a high pec, you only get tissue once because it's full cytoreduction and you don't have that longitudinal view. So that's something that's still underway at the NCI and thank you so much for that question. Quick question. Um, this patient had a clinically indicated diagnostic laparoscopy to get your tissue. I'm curious if that wasn't the case or you know, what 
how much tissue do you need and what is it worth it? How would you, is there any role for core biopsy or what, what types of tissue do you need if they aren't necessarily needing a diagnostic laparoscopy? Right, thank you so much for that question. So um, we are only limited to either a diagnostic laparoscopy right. or if they are getting a full-blown cytoreductive surgery. Sure. Unfortunately, we, ha we actually tried to change the model to be adaptable to solid tumors and using like core biopsies, but the core biopsies tend to disintegrate within the peristaltic, uh, with the peristalsis of the media, and so we haven't been able to maintain that. So if it's not a, if it's not a diagnostic laparoscopy, it's a cytoreductive surgery of which we get more tissue, but you don't actually need that much tissue. It's the, the platform, is, each are like one centimeter in diameter, so you don't need that much tissue, which is helpful because a lot of patients often don't have a lot of tissue to give. So, yeah. Great, great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.